Give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that are perceptive to what the Spirit of God is saying in this room this morning and early afternoon, Lord. And Lord, may your word go forth from this place. May your word go forth from the broadcast. Lord, may your word go forth from the radio telecast and touch lives, Lord Jesus. May this word pursue the hearts of those that are going to hear it, Lord, and those that you want to hear it. And Lord, may this word bring about a changing of mindsets. Lord, you're shifting the paradigms. You're breaking the ways of thinking that we've had in the church. Lord, you're showing us that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts than our thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth is the difference between the two, Lord. So, Lord, today we surrender our hearts to you. We open up our mouths so that you can fill our mouths, Lord. We surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. For Lord Jesus, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved. But your precious name, Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. In your precious name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Guys, we are in the midst of worship today. And I heard the Lord say that I have ordained change in the earth. I heard the Lord say that there's a mighty sudden wind beginning to blow and there's a change that's coming over the earth. The Lord said generations prior have said the Lord is, is slow in keeping his word. Generations prior said nothing is going to change. It will change in the latter generations. But the Lord is saying I've ordained change in the earth. The Lord says everything is about to change. Do not lay hold of the things that what what that what once were the Lord says but lay hold of the new thing that I'm doing I heard the Lord say once again Isaiah 43 18 and 19 the Lord said forget the past and let go of what lies behind for behold I'm doing a new thing I'm making streams in the desert and rivers in the wasteland the Lord said there's a mighty a sudden a quick change that's coming upon the earth the Lord said as the change comes listen to my spirit and you will know the changes of me because it will seem that there's chaos it will seem that things are out of control but I am in control says the Lord trust me trust me trust me the Lord said we're coming into a mighty culmination of things that I've been speaking for decades. The Lord said many things are going to happen and they're happening quickly. Did I not say go to your shelf and grab the dusty prophetic notebook for my spirit is blowing the dust off of it and opening up the pages and bringing to life the words that you thought were dead because I am the resurrection and I am the life. And the Lord says, watch, watch, watch. Blessed is the man who watches for me and waits at the gates. Because the Lord says the gates are about to open. The winds of change are blowing. The Lord says in an instant, I'm going to begin to change things that you've been waiting for. For a long, long time, says the Lord. The Lord says everything is about to change. The Lord says, do not hold on to what once was. But the Lord says, lay hold of the hem of my garment. It's time to move forward and not stand still. It's time to move forward and not go backward. The Lord said, a mighty rush is coming. A mighty wind is coming. The Lord says, I'm going to move you into a new thing. The Lord says, I'm going to begin to move through you in ways you never dreamed, never thought, ever imagined that I would move through you. And the Lord said, the suddenly has now come, but it's not man suddenly, it's not the enemy suddenly, it's not flesh suddenly. The Lord says, my suddenly, my ordained Cairo suddenly is coming now upon the earth. Watch, even now it's about to happen and the world will say, we don't understand what's going on. What is this? This is unprecedented. We've never seen this before. But the Lord said, I ordained this time before the foundations of the world were laid and my church will come forth. 
forth spotless and glorious walking in love with me in power and authority the Lord said a mighty shift is coming the light will become brighter and the darkness darker a mighty wind is blowing I'm releasing my signs in the heavens and in the earth Hallelujah. It's time to awaken, O oh church. It's time to awaken my people. This is not the hour to be asleep. The Lord says, waken from your slumber, O oh church, because your king is knocking upon the door. Change is coming. Change is coming. Change is coming suddenly, swiftly, says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Whew. How many receive that in the Lord right now? How many receive that in the Lord right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo. Brother Oli? Is Brother Oli in the house? No. Okay. Can someone find Brother Oli and let him know we're going to need a little bit of a change with the headset back there? Oh, hallelujah. How many are excited about the Lord Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many are ready to receive the word this morning? Amen. All right. You've already had a prophetic word. Now you're going to receive the word this morning. You've got your Bible with you this morning. Let's go to Malachi chapter 4. Let's go to Malachi chapter 4. And we're going to continue our series on the orphan heart this morning. And we're going to call this Finding Our Way Home, Freedom from the Orphan's Heart. How many have been enjoying the Orphan's Heart series? I tell you, the Lord has taken us through a holy knot hole with this. The Lord has just done incredible things uh, in this series. And as we begin this morning, I just want to welcome everyone, not only that's in the house, but I want to welcome our virtual family. And I want to welcome those that are going to hear this in the later radio broadcast. Um, I also want to welcome my son, Jeff Percival. My son in the Lord who just walked in the door and is partaking in the service. Man, it is good to see you. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, so if you have the word with you this morning, let's go to Malachi chapter 4. And when you get Malachi chapter 4, please stand up this morning. And uh, we're going to begin to talk about what can I do to begin to open up the door for the Father to dislodge orphan hearts or orphan thinking within me so I can begin to walk as a son or daughter in Christ and receive the inheritance that God has for me. So the word says this in Malachi chapter 4 starting in verse 1, Surely the day is coming. Now, I want to stop right there for just a moment because the Lord is saying he's taking the church from saying surely the day is coming to the day that the church is going to say it's happening now. The Lord said these words that I've spoken, there will be no more delay. How many hear this in the Lord? The Lord said we're going to go from talking about it, praying about it, longing for it to happen to it unfolding right before our very eyes. That's what the Lord was saying in the word that he released already this morning. The Lord says, surely the day is coming and it will burn like a furnace and all the arrogance and every evildoer will be stubble and the day that is coming will set them on fire, declares the Lord God Almighty. Church, there's a fire that's coming upon the earth. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit. John the baptizer said, I baptize in water, but what is, what is coming that will baptize in the Holy Spirit and with fire? How many received that in the Lord? Fire is coming upon the earth. And the word says this, not a root or a branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings in other versions, it says in his wing, in his beams, in other versions, and in his rays. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked, and there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses and the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. 
Now I want you to notice verse 5 and verse 6. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers, other translations say, and mothers to their children, and the heart of the children to their fathers and mothers. Or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Somebody say amen this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. So the Lord's been talking to us about this journey in the sonship. And yesterday I was spending time with the Lord. And I said, Lord, what is it that we're going to talk about tomorrow? Because the Lord hadn't given me the word yet. And the Lord says, I want you to continue talking about the orphan's heart. Because the Lord said, there's a move that's coming upon the earth. But this move will only be brought through my sons and daughters. It's not going to be a move that's going to come through orphans. The Lord said it's going to come through my sons and daughters. The Lord said that is why I'm about to release an anointing for encounters with the Father's love that's going to dislodge the orphan's heart from my people so they can rise up as the head and not the tail and walk as sons and daughters who have an inheritance so that I can release through them the mightiest move the earth has ever seen. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you guys, we want to be a part of this move. I'm going to say it again. The Lord has said we're going to go from talking about it to encountering it. How many are hearing this? We're going to go from talking about things, praying about things, wishing for things in the Lord, to suddenly in the Lord beginning to come. The Lord spoke a year ago. He said, you're going to have suddenlies, surprises, explosions, and breakthroughs. Hallelujah. And by the way, as I look around this room, I can see people that need suddenlies, surprises, explosions, and breakthroughs. How are you hearing what the Lord is saying right now? And I'm telling you, God says, I'm going to do a dunamos move in the earth. Now, that word dunamos is Greek. It's where we get the English word dynamite. <laughs> the Lord said, I'm going to do a work like dynamite in the earth. It's the dunamos power of God that blew Jesus out of the grave and he rose again. And the Lord says, I'm beginning to do a dunamos work in my people. I'm going to blow up the things the enemy has damned up. I bless you, Holy Spirit. Do that in this place. The Lord said, I'm going to remove the things that have hindered. And the Lord says, I'm going to begin to do things you've never seen me do before. And the Lord said, this is not a word for everybody else but you. The Lord said, this is a word for you. So the Lord says, I bless you. I am your father. I have amazing things for you. And the Lord says, watch what I'm about to do in your life. Hallelujah. And I hear an amen. amen. Hallelujah. So it's interesting. So far in the series, we've been talking about the orphan's heart and the spirit of sonship and how God desires for each of us to move from the, the heart of an orphan that's closed off to love to being sons and daughters secure in the love of Father God and able to give and receive God's love to others. Now, we've got to realize as God talks about dislodging the orphan's heart from his people. Guys, probably 80% of the people in the church walk in some form of orphanness. Yes. Let me say that again. I really believe up to 80% of people in the church walk in some form of orphanness. So I don't want you to feel a spirit of condemnation come over you as we're talking about this because there's therefore now no condemnation yes. for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I hear an amen? amen? We've got to understand every single one of us was born with an orphan's heart because you were born in the bloodline of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, when they were placed in the garden, we understand Adam was placed first and then Eve. But we've got to understand when Adam and Eve walked in perfect, unbroken, unhindered fellowship with God, the Lord would come down in the coolness of the evening. They'd walk with him. They'd talk with him. They would enjoy him. They walked as a son and a daughter. That's the heart of God. Us walking as a son and daughter in the garden with the Lord, unhindered. 
That's where the Lord wants to take the church back to. Unfortunately, when Adam and Eve fell, they, uh, they gained an orphan's heart because they were expelled from the garden. We don't see in the Lord God coming to them after that the way that he did prior. In fact, after the Lord brings forth the curse that came because of sin, when we hear about Adam and Eve and the word after that, it's primarily reproductive. And Adam and Eve begat, and Adam and Eve begat, and Adam and Eve begat. We never hear about those intimate moments again. It doesn't mean they didn't have some, but we don't hear about the level of intimacy with God after the fall that we hear about prior. But how many know when the Lord Jesus died and rose again, he opened up the door to the garden for us once again. So through the blood of Jesus, we can enter in and we can allow that orphan's heart to be expelled and we can begin to walk as the sons and daughters God created us to be. That's what God wants to do in your life. That's what God wants to do in your life. Because the Lord says this greatest move that I'm about to release in the earth will not come through orphans. It will come through sons and daughters. See, a son or a daughter knows who they are. An orphan doesn't. Is anybody catching that? A son or a daughter knows who they are, but an orphan doesn't. And this move is going to come through people that know who they are because of whose they are. And so God is bringing about a shift in the church. How many are hearing this this morning? Amen. And God so desperately wants you to be able to encounter his father's love. Because when you encounter the father's love, orphanness in your heart becomes displaced. Because you've heard me say before, you don't cast out an orphan's heart. It goes deep within us. You can have come from a perfect family with a mom and dad that were as perfect as the Cleavers, if you know what I mean. The older folks are going, yes. The younger folks are going, what are you talking about? Leave it to Beaver. Look it up. YouTube it. You'll figure out who the, the Cleavers were. But anyway, you can have come from a perfect family but still have an orphan's heart because this goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. So we've got to understand this. But the Lord wants you to be able to receive his love because if you can receive his love, then you can pour his love out on other people. And that's what the Lord is wanting to do at the end of the age. There's going to be a generation of sons and daughters so in love with the Lord Jesus that everywhere they go, the love of God is going to pour out through them. And they're not going to have theological debates with people. The love of God is going to flow through them and people's hearts are going to be touched and people are going to cry out and receive Jesus as Savior. Does anybody receive this today? And guess what? God wants to do this through you. God wants to do this through you. So how many are willing to receive this today? I'm going to keep saying it until everybody in the room and everyone on the broadcast says yes. I receive what God says today because this is the reality in the Lord. This is the reality in the Lord. We're either going to live like a son or a daughter that has a home, an inheritance, a place at the Father's table, or, listen to this church, we're going to live a life like an orphan that has no home, no inheritance, no safe place, and nowhere to go where we can be loved and accepted. And I'm going to be honest with you. The church is the, the place where people are supposed to be able to go to find love and acceptance. How many churches in the Rock River Valley Revival region can people walk into today and really feel loved and accepted? I'm going to say there's very few. That's why when people walk around the foyer in this house, I want them to feel the love of God. But here's the danger. If you're an orphan, you can't pour out God's love to people. Because you can't pour out what you don't have. But what God wants to do is begin to displace that orphan's heart and give you encounters with his love and build a deep well of the love of the Father in you so that when you meet the hurt, the lost, the wounded, and the dying, the Holy Spirit can draw from that well within you and begin to pour that out over other people. 
And here's the thing is that well is poured out. Holy Spirit is going to keep digging deeper so you can have deeper encounters with the Father's love so you can pour out more of the love of the Father. So if a church is full of orphans, when people come around the corner, how can the love of the Father be poured out? So the Lord has to begin healing the orphan's heart of the church so we can walk as sons and daughters. And I believe one of the greatest moves of God at the end of the age is going to be displacing the orphan's heart and giving his people the heart of sons and daughters. Then things are really going to begin happening. And I hear the Lord saying those things are going to begin happening very, very quickly. How many receive that? Amen. So here's the thing. God wants to begin displacing orphan thinking and orphan cycles in the lives of his people through the power of God. See, here's the thing. Whether it's the kingdom of light or it's the kingdom of darkness, everything is a process. You've heard me talk about the process in the Lord. When we're saved and we enter into the kingdom of God, when we say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. You died for me. You rose again. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. You're coming back soon. Come into my heart and save me, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. When you truly have a born again experience with the true and living God, you enter into the kingdom, but you enter in as a servant. When you first get saved, I just want to do whatever God wants me to do. Lord, where can I go? What can I do? Right, Lord, where are they feeding the homeless? All right, Lord, where's this going on? Where's that going on? I want to be a part of that. But the Lord doesn't want us to stay there. The Lord wants us to grow and go from being a servant of God to being a child of God. Wait a minute. I've got a loving Heavenly Father who's absolutely amazing. and He loved me before I ever loved Him. And from then being a child of God to being a son of God, and then from being a son of God to being the bride of Christ. Why does the Lord want to dislodge the orphan's heart from his people? Because that the orphan's heart hinders that progression. And at the end of the age, we've got to be the bride of Christ without spot and without wrinkle. Yes. How many hear that? Yes. So that orphanness blocks us from going from being children of God to sons of God and then ultimately the bride of Christ. The orphan's heart is a heart that blocks what God wants to do. So we've got to understand this has to happen. God has to release a powerful move of the Father's love at the end of the age for things to move forward the way that God wants them to. This is God's plan. Here's the problem on the other side of things. If you walk with an orphan's heart, then you're going to walk in orphan thinking and you're going to get caught in orphan cycles. Now the world talks about this and sings about this and they don't even realize what it is that they're referencing. Papa was a rolling stone. Anybody remember that one? Okay. What's that about? Papa just went from place to place to place to place to place to place to place. That's the orphan's heart. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in all the wrong faces. You can't sing that stuff in church. I just did. <laughs> See, here's the problem. And let me be real honest with you guys. And you know this is a very honest pulpit. The way that God designed things is that dad in the household would find out from the Holy Spirit who his kids are and then speak into his kids that identity, that destiny, that calling that God has placed upon their lives. How many are catching this? Amen. So what has the enemy done for generations? Taken dad out of the house. Now, there may be some amazing people in this room who were raised by an incredible single mom. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I'm so thankful for those moms. But here's the challenge. A woman can never tell a man who he is. God designed it so that only a man can tell his son who he is. Only a man, a dad, can tell his daughter who she is. That relationship between dad and son, dad and daughter is so crucial as far as developing identity. And here's the problem. Let me be honest. 
If a man doesn't receive that disbursement, that anointing, that reality of identity from his dad, then what's going to happen as he grows up is he's going to go from woman to woman to woman to woman trying to find a woman that can tell him who he is. And she can't do it. She can't do it. So he's going to be with a woman long enough that he realizes she can't seem to, to tell me who I am. He may not think it in those words, but he's going to say think something to himself like, she just doesn't do it for me anymore. This isn't working. It wasn't what it once was. Then he's going to go to another and another and another and another. And then there's kids that are brought forth through those relationships. And papas are rolling stone and cycles perpetuate. But the Lord Jesus said, I became the curse, so you no longer have to live under the curse. Hallelujah. The Lord is breaking that cycle of fatherlessness. So if you're sitting there right here, if you're sitting here right now thinking or listening to the broadcast or, or the radio broadcast and thinking, but wait a minute, I didn't get that from dad. Dad's not in my life, may not ever be in my life. Dad is dead. I don't know where dad is, whatever the situation is. The word says that we will call the Lord Jesus wonderful counselor, everlasting father, and prince of peace. So you can get that release of identity through encounters with the Lord Jesus. How many are catching that? So if dad didn't give it to you, hallelujah, father is going to give it to you if you press in and really seek this in the Lord. Now, pastor, are you trying to nullify the importance of mom in the home? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's very interesting when we look at the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son in Hebrew are mentioned in Hebrew masculine. Holy Spirit is mentioned in Hebrew feminine. So I really believe mom in the household, being the mom that she's supposed to be, hallelujah, when that happens, mom's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Yes, amen. Josiah, is she not? Mom's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But here's the thing, and please don't raise a hand. How many lived in a home with a healthy dad? How many lived in a home with a healthy mom? There's some that are hearing this word and you're thinking to yourself, I didn't really have either. And I was kind of on my own from the beginning. See, that's part of the orphan's heart. One of the signs that you have an orphan's heart is you never had a childhood. I was never able to be a kid because I had to be parent to mom or dad. I was never able to be a kid because I had to grow up fast and take care of things. My great-great-grandfather was an alcoholic, gambler, and womanizer. He would leave my grandfather and uh, his siblings, eight siblings, four boys, four girls, out on a sharecropper's farm in a shack. And so my grandfather at a young age had to learn how to hunt and fish and take care of his brothers and sisters. He never got to have a childhood. So he grew up thinking, when I marry and I have kids, I'm gonna be a provider because that's what a dad is. So he was a great provider for my dad and, and my aunts and and for my grandmother, but he didn't know how to love because he never received love. How many know that doesn't have to be the end of the story because through encounters with the Father's love, we can learn how to love. We can learn how to give. We can learn how to be a conduit. The Lord said to me years ago, he said, Andrew, through encounters with me, I can give you things that you didn't receive growing up so that you can pour them out on other people. So I don't want you to think because my family wasn't perfect. This wasn't perfect. That wasn't perfect. I don't think I'm ever going to encounter the Father's love or flow in the Father's love. That's a lie of the enemy and that's orphan thinking. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying right now? Now I want to draw your attention back to Malachi 4. The Lord says in verse 1, Surely the day is coming. And the Lord talks about judgment. And the Lord talks about things happening in the earth. Verse 1 is really all about what's going to happen to the lost. It's all about what's going to happen to the wicked. It's all about what's going to happen to those that don't know God, reject God, and don't want God. 
right? The word says, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogance and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord God Almighty. And not a root or a branch will be left to them. How do you know if that was the end of the story? That would be a pretty discouraging story. But how many know verse number two, word number one, but... How many here have ever been in the midst of something and you have found the Holy Spirit welling up within you and instead of saying something negative, two words come out of your mouth, but God. Amen. Hallelujah. And the situation was dark, but God. Amen. But the doctor gave a negative report, but God. Amen. My spouse said it was over, but God. My kids said they didn't want Jesus, but God. How many received that? So I want you to notice verse number two. But for you who revere my name. See, we've got to understand something. Because, because the Lord spoke in a prophetic word at the beginning of this message. The Lord said things are about to happen in the earth quickly. There's a mighty shift that's about to come on the earth. And we're going to go from praying about things and talking about things and longing for things to those things unfolding right in front of our very eyes. There's going to be a huge distinction between light and darkness in what's going to be going on at the end of the age. So the Lord said for one group, there's going to be fire and destruction and all these things happening. But the Lord said, but for my people, those who revere my name, the son of righteousness is rising up over you with what in his wings? Healing. See, this is what God's doing at the end of the age. He's rising up over his people with healing in his wings. And it's fascinating because you look at the Ark of the Covenant and on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant you had the cherubim like this and their wings met over the top of the Ark and there's the mercy seat and the Ark itself. And when David moved the Ark onto the mountain and he just put a tent around the Ark during the day as they were prophesying and singing and crying out, they would open up. They would open up the tent and you could see the ark and the sun would shine down through the wings of the cherubim and they believed that David would lay down in the shadow of his wings. The Lord said, I'm going to rise up over you with healing in my wings, another translation in my beams, another translation in my rays. And I want you to catch this church and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Now this is interesting. The Lord says, I am going to rise up over you with healing in my wings. That word wings in the Hebrew is kanop. K-A-N-O-P. And it means the end or the border of a garment. Does anybody remember the woman with the issue of blood? She pushes through the crowd and she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment then I will be healed. Well, in the Hebrew, she really said, if I can just touch his talit, the talit was actually mm, from the hem of the garments, there's pieces of fabric that came down that were intertwined and woven that came down at the end of that garment. Why did she believe there was healing in his talit? Because in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil. They would pour the oil down the head and go down the beard and into the talit or the collar of the robes. They believed that's where the anointing oil gathered. So the woman with the issue of blood believed that she could touch the hem of his garment, he would be healed. She would be healed. And how do you know she was? So what's the Lord saying? At the end of the day, I'm going to entire generation with healing in the folds of my garments or my talit. And all that generation is going to have to do is lay hold of me and the healing is going to come. Does that excite anybody? Amen. See, you're not the healer. Jesus is the healer. Yes. He makes the talit available. He just says, reach up and grab it. In the wilderness, when, when Israel was in the wilderness and people were dying because snakes were coming and biting people, the Lord said to Moses, he said, make an image of a snake, put it up on a pole, lift it up, and anyone who looks to the snake is going to be healed. How many know that was a picture of Jesus? He would be lifted up, and whoever would look upon him would be saved. 
And I hear an amen. The Lord's going to rise up over a generation and the Lord says, whoever wants to take a hold of the hem of my garment and healing is going to be released into your orphan's heart. That's what God's going to do. Now the Lord also says this, when I do that, you're going to leap like a calf released from the stall. Now this is interesting. That word stall in the Hebrew means this, a place where you are tied up, circling round and round. Do you know what that is? That's orphan thinking and orphan cycles. It keeps you going round and round and round and round. But the Lord says, I am the answer. I'm going to rise up over a generation so they can lay hold of my talit and receive healing from me. And then they're going to leap forth from the stigles that they've been stuck in, that their people, the generations before them have been stuck in. And they're going to go after me and they're going to turn the world upside down for me at the end of the age. Jesus doesn't just reveal the problem. He is the answer. Hallelujah. And that's what the Lord is beginning to do right now in this generation. Trust me, guys. In 20 years of ministry, the Lord is just now allowing me to teach on the orphan's heart. That tells me we're in a very strategic time in the Lord. Is anybody getting a hold of this in the Lord? So we've got to understand this. An orphan's heart... Connected orphans thinking and connected orphan cycles will keep you tied in a stall. But the Lord wants us to know there's a safe place for his sons and daughters. There's a safe harbor that we can enter into and find home, find peace, and find rest in the Lord. And right now, the Lord is offering that to a generation. He walked through the feast. And he, I believe he put his arms up and he said, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some translations will say, he said, I will give you peace. Peace in the Hebrew is shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Meaning when we come to Jesus, we come hurting, broken, splintered, wounded. But he heals us and makes us whole. Amen. How are you getting excited about the Lord? So let's tie this in because that's a little bit of review with some new things also the Lord's been talking about. But let's begin to talk about what are the steps that I need to begin to take to allow the Lord to begin releasing his love in my life, his healing in my life, his forgiveness in my life so that his love can flow through me unhindered Right, So I can walk as a son or a daughter and not an orphan. Now I want to say something here that's very, very important. This is a process. Everything in the kingdom is a process. And what I don't want you to do is think, Pastor's going to give me this list and I'm going to work this list. Right, I'm going to get through this list. Check, 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 check. Any list people in the room? I love list people. I know some people that are such amazing list people that they'll create a list of what they need to do that day. They'll work through the list. If they do something that's not on the list, they'll write it on the list so they can check it off. That is not my personality style. I love you amazing people. I just view life as being a little too short, you know, to do that. But if that's how God made you, you just be you in the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And help keep me organized. Okay. I really appreciate you guys. But we've got to understand we cannot take a checklist mentality before God. Because we don't serve a microwave God or a checklist God. We serve a God that crockpots. So what I'm talking about here, guys, is a crockpot process. Okay, I met with some of the guys from the church here this last week, and I brought up the crock pot more than once. This is a crock pot process that God is calling you to. But God is turning up the dial on the crock pot, and he's doing things more quickly. Then what do I need to do, Pastor? Stay in the crock pot! <laughs> Stay in the crock pot! You're either going to be in a crock pot or you're going to be a crack pot with the things that are done. You know what I'm saying? Stay in the crock pot. It's hot. It's not enjoyable. You're dying in the process. But you're going to be more like Jesus as you emerge from his crock pot. Amen. It's not easy. It's difficult. 
I've been in the crock pot. If you're not in the crock pot right now, just wait. You'll be in the crock pot because God does things through crock potting. Okay, usually I don't say, you know, raise your hands, but how many are in the crock pot right now? That's about half our group is in the crock pot. The other half, you'll be in the crock pot. It's going to happen. That's the way this thing is working. The angels are taking notes in the room right now. They're going, oh, we don't think he's in the crock pot right now. So we're going to deal with this thing. So we've got to understand this isn't about a checklist. It's about coming into alignment with the Father's heart and truth while walking away or coming away from old thinking and old patterns that have come from the enemy. So when the Lord was saying prophetically this morning that change is coming, don't just think that change is going to happen in the region, the state, the nation, Israel, and the earth. God wants to bring about change in you. Because the change starts with us. When does this region change? When the church changes. When does the state change? When the church changes. Guys, we don't go to church. We are the church. And it's time that we start acting like the church. And how many here don't raise a hand, know that you have orphan thinking, orphan patterns, right? Orphan things that are going on in your life constantly. And you think to yourself, when is this ever going to change? If I could just meet the right person, if I could just get the right job, if I could just have this much money, if I could just get the right house, if I could just get the right car. And here's a classic. If I could just win the lottery, <laughs> all my troubles would be over. Read about lottery winners. They're some of the most miserable people you ever meet. They lose their families. They lose their friends. And many of them end up in suicide. It's horrible. Money's not the answer. Jesus is. How many receive that in the Lord? So I'm telling you, we've got to stop thinking when my ship comes in, when does your ship come in? How does that work? No, the Lord wants us to lay hold of the hem of his garment and receive his healing and let the Holy Spirit begin to reprogram our minds and our ways of thinking so we can begin walking as sons and daughters filled with the love of the Father that can pour that love out to anyone that God brings us in contact with. How do you receive that? Because the day's coming where you're going to be doing the things that Jesus did in greater. But that's not going to happen through orphans. It's going to happen through sons and daughters. Okay, well, I'm stuck then. No, the son of righteousness is rising with healing in his wings. Can I hear an amen? And you're going to leap like calves released from the stall. Well, pastor, what do I do with that? You're in your quiet time. You're praying. Okay, Lord, you said. How many know God loves it when we say you said? Lord, you sit in Malachi 4, you're rising with healing in the hem of your garment. I want it. And you know what you do? You keep asking and you keep praying the word until it happens. Remember the parable of the persistent widow? What happened in that parable? The judge who was not a righteous judge finally said, I can't take her coming before me any longer. I'm just going to give this woman what she wants and send her on her way. But what does the word say? But you've got a loving father. A loving heavenly father. When you ask him for bread, he won't give you a stone. When you ask him for a fish, he won't give you a serpent. What's orphans thinking? Everybody around me asks the Lord for bread and they get bread. I get the stone. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? 1960s or 70s, there was an old country song about a guy that went through divorce. In the song, he says this, she got the mine and I got the shafts. It's okay to laugh at that. But that's orphan thinking. Everybody around me gets the mind, the mine, I get the shaft. God wants to break that orphan thinking in your heart. And by the way, if you don't have a family, God wants this church to be your family. Right? If you've got a family, we're not going to take the place of your family, but we're another family for you. Because you can't get enough family. David said, Lord, you put the lonely in families. The church is to be a family at the end of the age. Not a building. Not an institution. Come on. We're to be a family. Has anybody received that? But I want to give you some things, even though this is not a checklist process, but I want to give you some things and some examples of how God is taking me through this word in my life. 
as we talk about this this afternoon. So if I want to move from slavery to sonship, from orphanness to sonship, if I want to go on this journey of revelation and healing, what do I need to do? And I'm going to tell you what, guys, the Lord's going to start out here pretty heavy duty on this one. And I think this is going to hit home for a lot of us. So here's the first truth or the thing that we need to be doing in the Lord. And that is this. We have got to forgive our parents. Amen. We've got to begin to forgive our parents. Let me say that again. We've got to begin to forgive our parents. I want to show you something here in Matthew chapter 18 that I know you've heard before, but God is speaking to the church about this right now, and it's so important to him. And Cindy's got the slide up on this one right now, right where it needs to be. But I want you guys to see this, and the Lord is speaking to this to us right now. Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 to 4, the word of God says this. Hmm. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples are arguing amongst themselves, who's going to be the greatest? And the Lord Jesus calls this little child over and says, you want to be the greatest? Humble yourselves like this little child. So what is the Lord saying? The Lord is saying when we let go of the orphan's heart and we begin to walk like a son or daughter, we begin to realize it's not about us. It's about our king and his kingdom. How many are hearing this? It's about our king and it's about the kingdom. So we've got to understand this in the Lord. And what is the kingdom all about? Humility, innocence, and love. It's childlike. Hallelujah. So pastor, how do I lay hold of the hem of his garments? We have to humble ourselves. And we have to begin to realize, I need the hem of his garments. I need the Lord Jesus healing. How many are hearing this? And the depth of humility that you embrace is going to determine the depth of the kingdom life you're going to experience. Let me say this again. The depth of humility that you're going to embrace or willing to embrace is going to determine the depth of the kingdom life that you're going to experience. Here's part of the problem when I start talking about the kingdom. Most of us, especially if we came up in the church, we weren't really taught the kingdom. We were taught a church. We were taught religion. We were taught a structure. Yes. We're not taught the kingdom. We're taught a system. Right. How are you hearing this? Yeah. And here's the thing. The bride of Christ does not belong to a system. She belongs to the bridegroom. So the Lord is breaking the church free from denominational mindsets, religious mindsets, organizational mindsets, and bringing the church into the kingdom mindset. In Jesus' earthly ministry, he didn't preach a church, he preached the kingdom. He said over and over again, the kingdom of heaven is light, the kingdom of heaven is light, the kingdom of heaven is light. You enter the kingdom through salvation, but once you're saved, then we will have to walk in humility. We have to go lower so that we can go higher. Very interesting, during pre-service prayer today, I heard the Lord say this, what goes down must come up. I said, okay, God, I need you to help me understand this. And the Lord said this, if you will go down in humility, I will lift you up. If a generation will humble themselves in the sight of the Lord, I will lift them up. How many want to go higher? then we've got to walk in the mindset of the kingdom. We have to become childlike, and we have to be willing to do what God wants us to do. This is where truth number one comes in. We've got to approach this truth in humility. 
We've got to forgive our parents for misrepresenting the Father's love to us. Now, do not raise a hand. How many had a dad? How many had a mom that misrepresented the Father's love to you? They were imperfect. They didn't receive what they needed growing up, right? There were circles and cycles that had gone on for generations in your family line. And guess what? You got a mom or a dad that was flawed. We've got to begin to realize something, guys. There's no perfect parents. Your parents weren't perfect. And if you're a parent, you're not a perfect parent either. Parents in the room, anyone here ever think about things that you did as your kids were growing up and think to yourself, I'd like to have that one back. <laughs> really, really like to have that one back. Okay, you know what? We all make mistakes. But here's the truth. God picked your parents for you. Well, Pastor, why do you believe that? I believe your, your life is not the result of mom and dad having a candlelight dinner and a little bit of romance. That's not how you got here. God planned you. God planned your parents. God planned your destiny. And at the perfect moment in time, the Lord rejoiced because he took a part of himself, mixed that with clay, and put that into your mother's womb, and you became. What did you become? Everything God created you to be. And the Lord says, I'm about to take you on a journey. The Lord said, I'm going to take you on a journey where I'm going to show you who you are. Because the Lord said, I want to do this because I want you to know me and I want to know you. And the Lord says, I want to show you that you don't have to search and wander any longer. You don't have to look for things that aren't going to satisfy. The Lord said, I want to show you that I love you. I want to show you my plan for your life. And the Lord says, there's something mighty I want to do in your life. Lord, Lord said, that's my heart for you. Hallelujah. Now you got to do something with that, right? The Lord speaks it and we got to do something with it. But from the moment you came in this morning, the Lord started talking about you. And the Lord wants you to know him. He wants relationship with you. And he wants to begin to do incredible things in your life. The Lord said, you don't even know who you are yet. But the Lord said, I want to show you who you are. And the Lord said, you're a lot more incredible than what people have told you you are. What life has told you you are. Even what your parents told you you are or didn't. The Lord said, I want to show you who you are because the Lord says to me you're precious and the Lord said I put treasure in this jar of clay receive that brother all right so here's the thing we want to keep in mind there's no perfect parents and we aren't perfect parents either so what the Lord wants us to begin to do is to forgive our parents how many receive that okay so God chose our parents for us and the Lord says the number one setting on the crockpot is we have to begin to forgive them. Amen. Now, how do I do that? Because you may be sitting here looking at me going, you know what? My parents were just flawed. They were this. They were that. I think I'm okay with that right now. Oh, go to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you reveal to me if there's any pockets in my heart of anger, hurt, bitterness, offense, disillusionment, fear, pain? <laughs> Right? Is there any time somewhere in my childhood where something happened and I closed my heart off to my parents' love and I never opened it up again? That's a big one. Holy Spirit, was there some point in my childhood where something happened and I stopped being my parents' son or daughter? I close my heart off to their love and to my ability to love them. And I became independent. I became rebellious. I started going on my own mission. Oh, captain, my captain. It may have been something large or it may have been something small or a series of things that began to shut your heart off to love, to affection, from affirmation, to your parents in your home growing up. Because here's the challenge. And this is for most people in the church. It happens somewhere in your childhood. You close your heart off to them and you stop being a son or a daughter. 
Then you start judging them. I'm never going to be like them. I'm never going to do what they did to me. In the realm of the spirit, there's something called a boomerang judgment. Looks just like a boomerang. You judge your parents, that judgment comes right back on you and you begin repeating the things that they did. That has to be broken in the realm of the spirits. See, the word says honor your father and your mother. It doesn't just say honor your father and your mother if they were perfect, if they were radically saved, if they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. There is this, an anointing of honor. It doesn't mean you, don't, you do things that are ungodly, immoral, or anything like that, that parents that don't know the Lord would suggest. But there should be a culture of honor in our hearts towards our parents. Even if they're with the Lord. Because this mess isn't just for folks with parents that are alive. Because then if they've passed and they're with the Lord, then, then this is done. We can't do anything about it. How do you know with the Lord all things are possible? Amen. And this healing can come. And here's the thing. is Sometime in your youth you shut your heart off to your parents and no longer receive their love, their affection, their warmth. Then you get married and you meet this person that you feel like is the perfect person and they're going to love you and it's going to be incredible. And then inevitably one day they're going to do something that hits a button. And you're going to go, you know what? They're just like... Or you're going to realize this person loves you with all of their heart, but something keeps you from loving them with all of yours. Why can't I give myself to my spouse completely? Why can't I love my kids completely? That blockage is the orphan's heart. Hey, don't raise a hand. Is the Lord knocking on anybody's door right now? Is the Lord going through anybody's mailbox right now? Okay, this is not condemnation. The Lord said, I want to teach you how to forgive your parents. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let's go to Psalm 45, verse 10. Psalm 45, verse 10. Okay, if the Lord isn't speaking to you yet, the Lord's going to speak to you soon. Okay, Psalm 45, 10. We'll look at verses 10 and 11. I want you to see what the word says this morning. Listen, O daughter, and consider and give ear. Forget your people and your father's house. The king is enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your isn't verse 10 interesting? Listen, O daughter, and consider and give ear. Forget your people in your father's house. Now it's interesting. If you look at that word forget in the Hebrew, it means letting go of your identity and brokenness and dysfunction that brought you from your parents house, an identity that will cause you to keep people at arm's length. Isn't that interesting? So that word in the Hebrew literally means letting go of your identity of brokenness that came from your father's house. It doesn't mean it was. It means you let go through the power of God, the brokenness, the hurt, the pain, the dysfunction that came from your parents' house. Well, why in the world or how in the world will I do that? Because I've got revelation that the king is enthralled with my beauty. God loves me with an everlasting love. And he wants to pour out his father's love over me and heal me so that what I grew up in, that dysfunction, that hot mess, isn't something I have to repeat and live the rest of my life. I can live as a son or a daughter with hope, life, and love. Has anybody received that? And here's part of the challenge, and I'm going to be real open and honest with you with this. If we grew up in a home that had dysfunction in it, that was challenged, that was broken, broken dad wasn't there, mom wasn't there, there was no encouragement, there was no love, Somewhere on along the line, your heart shut down. It happened. It's a defense mechanism. And somewhere your heart said, if I don't build a wall around my heart, I'm not going to survive this. Okay, the Lord wants to tear that wall down. Can I hear an amen? Amen. But that wall also causes us to only remember the bad things 
and not the good. Let me tell you what God's been doing in my life on this one. I'm going on the road last week, and I go past this business, and this business has a big sign out in front of it for their employees, Chuck E. Cheese Night. Oh, how many remember Chuck E. Cheese? Oh, yes. What a wonderful place, right? Then it had the, the counter business celebration station. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I remember as a kid, I wanted to go desperately to Chuck E. Cheese, but my parents were very, very frugal, okay? Frozen pizza on a Saturday night was what I thought was gonna be the closest I was ever gonna make it to Chuck E. Cheese. But that wasn't the case. And what happened was, I had forgotten about the memory with my mom. And so, so for those of you that know my story, I've got the quintessential amazing dad, 86, still pastoring full time. He's just the greatest dad in the world. Mom grew up in a very dysfunctional situation, very challenging. Um, There's possibly some very difficult things that happened to her um, while she was growing up, possibly at the hands of a brother. I mean, there's just horrible things that went on. Mom got saved in her early 30s, was an amazing pastor's wife, but had a lot of hurt and brokenness and pain. She was a wonderful woman. And uh, just about the time she and I started getting breakthroughs, she died of cancer when I was 21. Um, so that's been something God's been giving me healing over. And it's very easy to only remember the difficult things. So as I'm going down the road, company dinner, company night at Chuck E. Cheese, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I remember Chuck E. Cheese. And then the Holy Spirit says, do you remember? Holy Spirit said, do you remember that Sunday afternoon? There was morning service at Pelly Road. And late that afternoon, Mom said, you don't eat dinner before church because I'm taking you to Chuck E. Cheese. And Mom takes me to Chuck E. Cheese. We have pizza together. We hang out and watch the animated characters. She gives me some money. I go in and play in the arcade. Then we walk through the arcade together. And then we go to Sunday night service at Pelly Road. The Lord said, Andrew, do you even remember that? And the Lord brought that memory back into my spirit. And as the Lord did that, I laid a hold of the hem of his garment and some healing came. Now that's the way God did something in my life. He may do it in your life differently. But how many know God wants to do it? But that's part of the challenge when we begin to build up the wall around our heart. We don't remember anything that was good. We just remember the negative and the challenging. How many know that keeps us bound to our Father's house? How many are hearing this? How many know that keeps us bound to our Father's house? Now look at this. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. God wants to tear down the walls, and what does God want to give you? And this is important in Him. How many are in love with the Lord Jesus? Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Some of you know what we're about to read. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such things there is no law. For law is powerless over those things. How do you know these are the fruits of the Spirit? How do you know if you're an orphan? You don't know the fruits of the Spirit. You can look in on them, but you don't walk in them. Guys, this is part of the inheritance of a son or a daughter. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, meekness, self-control dwelling in your life even when things are difficult. How many are hearing this? So in the Word, and you don't even need me to take you through the verses, the Word commands us to forgive. And forgiveness begins at home. Psalm 45, 10 and 11, the Lord says, Forget your father's house! See, I don't have to forgive them. I've got a right because they were wrong. No. The Lord says, I want you to let go of the dysfunction and the hurt and the pain through my healing so you can be whole. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing about forgiveness, guys. 
Even if the other person was 99% in the wrong, and you're 1% wrong, the Lord says you need to go and seek forgiveness in that situation. That's where humility comes in. That's where humility comes in. Challenging, isn't it? Yeah. And here's the thing. If we choose not to do so, then we're going to live with anger, trust issues, and intimacy issues. Yeah. Don't raise a hand. Who here has anger issues, trust issues, and intimacy issues? If you do, this is an orphan heart blocking love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, meekness, and self-control. And by the way, if you don't want to lay hold of the hem of the Lord's garment, if you don't want to forgive people, if you don't want to be let go from your father's house, you can live in this the rest of your life. And you know what? Jesus will love you and you can be radically saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, but you're going to be stuck. So I'm not saying this is a salvation issue, but what I'm saying is this is an abundant life issue. This is a zombie life issue. This is a receiving everything God has for you issue. And you can only hold on to one thing at a time. So if you hold on to orphanness, you can't hold on to intimacy. If you hold on to orphanness, you can't hold on to trust. Is anybody catching this? This is a blocking condition. Right? If someone has blockages in the heart, they got to go in and they've got to deal with those blockages. What's the Lord saying? Forgiveness starts helping you deal with the blockage, and it needs to start at home. Yes. May need to start with mom and dad, and then work its way to brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. But pastor, my mom and dad are gone. Okay, then you can go into your secret place and pray, and you can forgive in prayer. Lord, I know my mom and dad are gone, but I just come before the throne boldly right now, covered in the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I choose to forgive my mom and dad. If you don't, this is going to block you in every relationship. This is even going to block your relationship with the Lord. Where does this, well, I ask the Lord for bread and he gives everyone bread but me. That comes from this, guys. Why does, God ever, why does God give everyone an incredible spouse but me? Why do things will try to seem to work out for everybody but me? You know what? God's got everything for you, but God wants to break the orphan's heart, orphan cycles, orphan thinking in your life. Don't live with this any longer because it's robbing you of God's best for your life. I'm here this. Okay. Let's go on to truth number two, and truth number two may be harder than truth number one. Truth number two is this. We need to ask our parents to forgive us for the way that we hurt or disappointed them. I've got news for you. If your parents hurt or disappointed you, at some point you closed your heart off to them, and then you went on a mission to hurt and disappoint them. I'm going to hurt the one that hurt me. I'm going to make the one miserable that made me miserable. And whether you realize it or not, you became that very thing. Now, this is a tough one. Because to really grasp this, we have to forgive mom and dad to be able to begin to realize, you know what? I did things that hurt them also. Let me be real with you. I'm studying this in the secret place yesterday, and I'm thinking, you know, Lord, Lord, this is a really good truth. You ever done that with the Lord? He brings the truth to you. Lord, that's a really good truth. How many know you're not really completing the sentence? This is what you're really saying. Lord, this is a really good truth, and I hope people around me get this one. When the Lord's really saying, this is a really good truth for you, is what the Lord is saying. So I'm sitting there going, yeah, this is good stuff, Lord. This is, this is really good stuff, God. Yeah, this is going to be really good tomorrow. You know, it's interesting. Here's the thing, and I'm going to say it again. <coughs> Asking your parents to forgive you may seem a little odd, but the reality is at some point you closed your heart off to them and became independent rebellious, you worked to make them miserable, you went on your own mission. All you could see in them was their shortcomings. 
all you can see in them were the things they haven't come to, to grips with. And when you went on your own mission, you started disappointing them. And you didn't care. Because when you're an orphan, you don't care about how your actions affect other people. All you think about is your needs, your wants, and how you feel. I know that one's rough, but this is the absolute truth. If you can just torch people and hurt people and not think twice about it because you've got this attitude, well, they were in the wrong anyway, so they got what they deserved. There's some orphan roots in your heart that we've got to allow the Lord to begin to deal with. So about the time I'm thinking, yeah, Lord, that's really good stuff, and I people think people are going to get a lot out of truth number two, the Lord said, Andrew, this is for you. And I went, oh, really? And the Lord said, yeah. The Lord said, your mom's with me, but I want you to call your dad. And I want you to repent before your dad because at some point you closed off your heart to him and to your mom. And you became independent, rebellious, stubborn. Oh, you went to there. You were doing your own thing. Right? You were beginning to delve into your own private addiction. All kinds of things were going on in your life. And mom and dad had no clue and you're doing it right underneath their roof. You need to apologize for that. And I'm going, I'm 54. I'm a pastor. I'm a dad. I've got a family. And the Lord says, do it! Well, it's, you know, it's noon on Saturday. Dad's going to be busy. There's things going to be going on. We're not going to be able to connect God. Call him. Dial in the phone. Okay, God, but you know he's going to be busy right now. Ring. Hi, son. How you doing? <laughs> Hi, Dad. Why are you available at noon on Saturday? <laughs> so we kind of have a little bit of small talk, and then the Holy Spirit goes, do it. <laughs> And so I said, okay, Dad, I just need to share something with you. You know, at some point I closed off my heart to you and Mom, and I became independent, rebellious. I was involved in addiction. I was immoral under your roof. I did all kinds of things, and I just want to apologize. I just repent before you for that. My dad said something that was very surprising. He said, well, son, I want to apologize to you. And he started sharing some things that went on when he remarried um, after mom died and sharing some things and, and repenting. And we just went back and forth. Dad, I just repent for this. Well, son, I just am sorry for this. And Lord, Dad, I apologize for this. Well, son, I apologize for that. It was an incredible encounter in the Lord. And even as it's happening, the Holy Spirit is revealing things to me that I'd forgotten that were really, really good. Right? And Holy Spirit is putting some pieces together of things that I didn't understand that happened. But now as a dad and a husband, I do. But as a kid, I didn't get it. You know? And, and I was able to reach up and lay a hold of the hem of the Lord's garments. But how they know it took humility. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. But the Lord spoke to me after that and he said this. Because after we hung up, the Lord said to me, Andrew, this is the mission of restitution. And I said, what is that? The Lord says the mission of restitution states that if our actions or attitudes have brought hurt to another person, there may be a need for us to go to that person and make right any wrongs to break destructive and dysfunctional patterns that have carried into our relationships because of it. Ooh. And the Lord said, that's what this is. And I'm like, what? The Lord said, this is a ministry. It's the ministry of restitution. He said, it breaks the cycles of reaping relational dysfunction. And it allows me to begin to bring restoration in your life. I didn't even realize the things I was holding on to with my dad. But when I acted in obedience, God filled in the gaps. And I tell you what, when the, when the call was over, it was amazing. 
And then the Lord spoke this to me. And the Lord says, you know what? In your life, I want to bring you into the ministry of restitution. Alcoholics Anonymous and NA and all these groups get it because one of their steps is to go back to people that you've hurt and ask for forgiveness. They get it. It's a biblical principle. It works whether you're saved or not. How do they know the principles of the Bible even when the lost follow them? They work because these are universal principles. So it's going back and asking for forgiveness. It's not anything that anyone else tries to make it to be. It's you walking in the ministry of restitution, and let me add to that, reconciliation. That's what it is. And there may be people that God's going to send you to, to apologize to, and it'll be just like it happened with Dad. Amazing. Others will say to you something like, well, you know what? I'm glad you finally realized you needed to do that. Probably feel pretty good right now, don't you? Well, that's good. Well, thank you for doing that. Have a good day. You know what? It's not about how they respond. It's about you being obedient to God. And if you will be obedient to God, God is going to release healing in your life. The Lord said, what if your parents are with the Lord? He brought this up to me yesterday. He said, go into the secret place and start praying. Lord, you know my parents are with you, or I don't know where they're spending eternity. Lord, I just want to ask for forgiveness for closing off my heart to them, disappointing them, being rebellious to them, hurting them. See, when you not only forgive your parents, but you ask your parents to forgive you, you are beginning to be subject to the Father's mission. Oh, Captain, my Captain. You know, one of the amazing guys that the Lord has given me the privilege of beginning to embark in a, in a mentoring journey with said to me the other day, he said, that message, oh, captain, my captain, that's the one that got me. And that message is going to open throughout this entire Orphan's Heart series. Who's going to be your captain? Right? Either the Lord Jesus is going to be your captain or the father of lies is going to be your captain. And even if you think you're your own independent captain, it's still the father of lies that's captaining you. See, we've got to realize this. So forgiving mom and dad and asking mom and dad to forgive you is about getting on the father's mission. How many are hearing this? How many are hearing this in the Lord? Yeah. See, this is where the rubber begins to meet the road. And I want this house to be a house that can love on anybody God brings. Hallelujah. You want to know the day that I'm waiting for? When God brings someone into this house from the LGBTQ community. Because I want us to love that person into the kingdom. Hallelujah. As well as the alcoholic and the drug addicts. As well as the person that deals with mental illness. Is anybody hearing this? We don't want to be an orphan ministry. We want a ministry to orphans. There's a difference. If you have an orphan ministry, all you're going to raise up is orphans. But if you have a ministry to orphans as a son or a daughter, you're going to be able to raise up sons and daughters. Because, Ray, we can teach people what we know, but we can only reproduce what we are. Your spiritual DNA will go forth into your spiritual sons and daughters. See, that phone call to my dad asking for his forgiveness, and I asked him to stand in for mom also on that one, by the way. It wasn't just for me, but it's for everyone the Lord gives me the privilege of ministering to. Because the, my spiritual DNA in the Lord gets imparted to you. And if it's a DNA of mixture, then you get a DNA of mixture from me. If it's a DNA of loving Jesus but not forgiving people, you get that DNA. I can teach you what I know, but I can reproduce what I am. That's why you've got to let Jesus change you and dislodge the orphan's heart. So when you minister to people, you minister to them as a son and daughter so that they can receive. Because they'll receive what you got. 
Because you can't give what you don't got. You can only give them what you got. That's deep and theological. Did we follow that? That's why right now Jesus is taking the crock pot down. And he's going, I want to deal with this. Anybody hear this? Now I want you just to listen to this. I'm going to read out of Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the most important commandment, with a promise, notice verse 3, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now that goes back to the Torah, Deuteronomy 15, 16. And it's just being requoted by Paul in the church at Ephesus. So let me ask you a question. You can raise a hand on this one if you want. Does anybody in the room want it to go well with them and enjoy a long life on earth? Amen. Universal biblical principle, honor your father and mother. Now that comes down to what's honor. You can honor mom and dad even if they're gone. You can honor mom and dad even if they're unsaved. By not holding hurt, pain, resentment, anger, bitterness in your heart towards them and by not trying to make their life miserable. You honor them in how you talk to them. Who do you think you are? That's not honoring them, even if they're wrong. How many know even Jesus in his earthly ministry spoke words of honor to people that didn't deserve it? Now, he was strong. We need to be strong. But one of the things that God wants to begin to release in the church is a culture of honor. And it starts at home. If I don't honor Holly... Hannah, Aaron, Zach, and Kate aren't going to honor her either. If she doesn't honor me, they're not going to honor me. See, our kids are going to do the natural. How many are getting this? See, David said, forget your father's house. But the Lord is saying, it, all, it goes back to the father's house. That's the beginning. And some of us have to go back to the beginning to get to the proper ending that God has for us. This message is a choice. What's your choice going to be? What's your choice going to be? And even if mom and dad are still alive and they're a mess, you can still honor them in your speech yeah. and in your heart and how you talk about them when someone brings them up. Right? Hey, tell me about your dad. Oh, he's out. Speak what God is speaking about him. You know what? God's about to do something amazing in his life. And God's going to touch you, heal and restore you. How many hear this? And by the way, I had a mom who went through a lot of dysfunctional things that hurt and pain, didn't know how to encourage, didn't know how to love, um, knew how to love other people's kids, but with her own, it could be kind of a challenge. You know, but it was an amazing woman, an anointing woman, touched a whole lot of kids. Right, that are now adults and are, and are serving the Lord. She had an amazing life. I can remember I was 19 years old and I'm coming up the stairs at home and mom's talking to somebody on the phone and she's talking about how I'm going to college and, and developing relationship again with the Lord and things are happening and how proud she was of me. <coughs> and I can remember thinking, mom, Why can't you just say that to me? Because I've never heard you say that. I thought, I thought to myself, I've heard you say this, this, and this, but I've never heard you say that. How many know that's part of the crock pot journey? And the Lord reminded me as I was talking to my dad yesterday, it's time to forgive her and let that go. Because you heard her say that she loved you and she was so proud of you. Receive that. Is anybody getting that? See, that's some challenges I dealt with with my mom. Other people had a mom that got drunk and came in your bedroom at night and beat you. Other people's had, had dads that you prayed that you weren't home when he came home. My mom had a dad that was a teamster, drove for Arkansas Freight his whole career. Um, he drove during the week, so he wasn't home all week long, over the road. And then when he came home on weekends, my mom and her brothers went and stayed at friends' houses. Because he was just a brute. 
when he came home. I've never been through that, but some in this room probably have. Violence growing up, anger, addiction in the home, being told you weren't going to amount to anything, horrible things being said and done to you. I had a good friend growing up in the church. Her, her name, she was absolutely amazing. Her name was Becky. And Becky's dad, who attended the church, his form of discipline was when she did something she shouldn't, to light a match, blow it out, and then put it down on the center of her, top of her hands. Another friend, the discipline was being burnt with cigarettes. See, I've never been through something like that, but the principle is the same. The Lord wants to set you free from your father's house. It happens through forgiveness. Some of you may be thinking right now, I'm not exactly sure why I came for this word today. I can tell you why you're here for this word today. Because God wants to do something in your life. And God is bringing this word to you today because it's time to lay hold of the hem of the Lord's garment. How many are hearing this word? Okay, we're going to wrap up with this. Truth number three. Once you have forgiven mom and dad, and you've asked for forgiveness for mom and dad of how you've hurt them and wounded them and caused them pain, now it's time to refocus our life on becoming a son or a daughter. Now it's time. I'm going to tell you guys, when I was... Uh, 21 and my mom passed my dad remarried six months later our family blew apart our church blew apart everything that I knew that was familiar was gone within that year I mean it's absolutely unbelievable the carnage that the enemy brought about I got upset with my dad <coughs> his choices he and I didn't have a relationship for 20 years 20 years over that. But the Lord got to the point where he started dealing with my heart and saying, you know what, I want you to get this right. And the Lord said to me, Andrew, ministry of restitution, your ministry is going to be stuck if you don't fix this. Is anybody hearing this? See, this is a challenge. This is a challenge. So once we begin to realize, I don't want to live this way any longer. I'm going to forgive and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. Now as we're touching the hem of his garment, we can begin focusing on living as a son or as a daughter. And here's the thing, and this can be a challenge, especially if all you've known is the orphan's heart. This is so important in the Lord. A heart of sonship in the Lord recognizes the need for interdependence with God. See, God doesn't want codependence. God wants interdependence. Is anybody catching this? See, the Lord created it so that we need Him and He needs us. He wants a relationship of interdependence. It's pretty amazing in my marriage with Holly, she and I have a partnership. I believe that's what Adam and Eve had in the garden before the fall. I believe they had a partnership. But we also know in our marriage, if a tough decision needs to be made, I'll step up and make that decision. Yeah. Okay, I'll step up. That's headship. That's a godly principle also. But you know what the Lord said to husbands? He said, don't lord this over your wives. Love them like Christ loved the church who was willing to lay his life down. See, Holly and I don't have a codependent relationship. I don't complete her and she doesn't complete me. Jesus completes us. And even though if a tough decision needs to be made, I'll step up and make that decision. We partner together. Even the Lord, even though the Lord is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, He's Alpha and Omega, He's the head of the church, He's the head of your life, He doesn't want to lord that over you. He wants a divine partnership with you. If you've got an orphan's heart, you're thinking to yourself, that's just too good to be true. 
Because I've read those verses about he slew it so and so and he wiped out this group and he sent fire on this group. You know what? The Lord's first response is love. We're either going to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior or we're going to know him as the righteous judge. That's the way it's going to happen, guys. And if we know him with Savior, even though it's like this, he wants to take our hand and do it like this. That's interdependence. I need you and you know, and you need me even though I know you're Lord of my life. Does anybody want that with the Lord? Yeah. See, if we begin to focus on our, our life on being a son or a daughter, we begin to have an attitude of submission to the Lord. And that attitude of submission to the Lord is where we don't feel like I give up everything, he takes everything. And we've got a give and take relationship. Right? I give it and he takes it. No. We begin to realize that he doesn't ask for anything if he doesn't plan to give me so much more in its place. Amen. Anybody receive that? I didn't think the Lord was going to take us here, but he's going to take us here. So there's this little girl. And... Uh, Dad gave her this little necklace, and it was a poppy seed that was encased in a little bit of piece of glass and had a loop on it, and there was a necklace, and she wore it around her neck, and she loved it. She wore it every single day. For years, she loved it. When she turned 12 years old, she was coming home from school, came in the house, walked past Dad's study. Dad was in there working, and he said, hey, honey, come here. So she comes in, and Come and sit on my lap, and she does. And he says, I love you. And she says, I love you, Dad. And Dad says, would you give me that poppy seed necklace? And she loves that necklace so much, she starts crying. And she says, no, Dad, I can't give this to you. This is my most precious possession. And she runs off his lap, runs out of the room, and tries to avoid him the rest of the night. So the next night, she's coming home from school, and she tries to walk quickly past the door to his office. He sees her and says, hey, honey, come on, climb up on my lap. Honey, will you give me that poppy seed necklace? And she grasps it and says, Dad, this is my most precious possession in the world. Why would you even want this? No, I'm not going to give this to you. She runs off his lap and runs out of the room. Third night, she comes home. From school calls her in his office honey get on my lap honey will you give me this poppy seed necklace and she starts weeping on his lap and just says dad I don't understand this at all you know I love this why would you take this from me you gave it to me I've worn it for years when I see it I think of you God why would you why would you want this and dad didn't say a word she just looked into dad's eyes and cried as he cried. And then she takes it off her neck, puts it in her little hands, puts it in the dad's outstretched hand, starts sobbing now, climbs off his lap, head held low, goes to exit the room. He said, honey, come back. She crawls back up on his lap and says, I have something for you. He opens up the desk drawer and there's a jewelry container in the desk drawer. And he opens it up, and it has a beautiful strand of pearls in it. And he takes those pearls, and he puts them around her neck. And he says, honey, I couldn't give you the strand of pearls until you were willing to give me the poppy seed necklace. This was always my intention for you. But you had to give up that poppy seed necklace so I can give you something so much greater. That is interdependence. And that's the heart of God for you. And the Lord just wants us to know today that not only does the Lord want you to be able to walk as a son or daughter because of what? 
he has for your heart and intimacy and experiences he wants you to have with him. The Lord is also going to have you raise up sons and daughters. And you can't be a spiritual father or mother if you haven't been a son or a daughter. He wants to give you the strand of pearls, but you've got to give up the poppy seed necklace. And the challenge is we can hold on to things that are so valuable to us that in reality are not worth anything at all. And if we'll surrender those things to the Lord, he'll give us things of great value. Intimacy, love, healing, restoration, provision. His heart is to give that to you, but if you walled off your heart to your parents at some point, the Lord Jesus shows up at the wall and you won't let the wall down even to him because you created that wall for protection and that wall doesn't distinguish between your parents, your spouse, your friends, church family, Jesus. The wall is a wall. And it's just always up. And so you hold people, even God, at arm's length. And you only let them get so far. And once they get to that point you're not comfortable with, you will reject them. That's called rejecting others before they can reject you. That's one of the spirits of rejection, right? Or you will orchestrate a situation so they leave your life. And you'll let people get right up to that wall, and then they're no longer in your life. The Lord says, I'm calling you to the ministry of restitution and reconciliation. I want you to put your hand in mine, and let's tear that wall down one brick at a time. I'm not going to tear it down all at once because then you're going to feel like you have no safety. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear it down with you and then I'm going to be the wall around you. There's a verse in the Old Testament where the Lord says, I will be the wall of fire about you and the glory within you. Ooh, isn't that a great verse? I'll be the wall of fire about you and I'll be the glory within you. Let's close with this passage. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 46. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 46. By the way, the Lord is in the room. This is a very somber word tonight, but the Lord is in the room. Why is the Lord in the room? Because he loves everybody in this room. Why is the Lord in this room? Because he wants to rise up over you with healing in his wings. Why is the Lord in this room? Because you're important to him. Why is the Lord in this room? Because he has an agenda, and the agenda is to heal. It's to set you free from your father's house. It's to give you breakthrough. Is anybody hearing this? Why don't you notice something? 1 Corinthians 15, 46. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. See, sometimes God has us work on things in the natural so that the supernatural can happen. Is anybody getting this? Why is God not moving in my life? Because in the natural, he wants you to ask for forgiveness of something, of someone. He wants you to forgive. The first man was the dust of the earth, and the second man was from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the man from heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been born in the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Isn't that interesting? Verse 50, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Isn't that beautiful? You know what the Lord is saying? When we walk in the orphan spirit, we're walking in the spirit of the flesh. When we walk within the, the spirit of the son or daughter, we're walking in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But in order for God to release some of the things in your life that he wants to, there's some things in the natural that he needs you to do. First comes the knowledge. 
then comes the test. So because you've heard this word today, I believe God is going to begin moving in your life in this area. If we want to truly become mature in Christ, that only happens as we focus on being a son or a daughter. And as we focus on becoming a son or a daughter, it's no longer about our mission. It's about the mission of our captain, the Lord Jesus. Oh, captain, my captain. So what are you going to do with this message? I'm going to tell you what the Lord wants to do. He wants to begin to give you encounters with the people that have hurt you. Oh, you'll bump into them at Walmart. You'll bump into them at Woodman's. You'll bump into them at school. You'll bump into them at different places. If they're with the Lord or have stepped into eternity, the Lord will begin to speak to you in your prayer times. He'll begin to speak to you going down the road. And he's going to begin to say, I want to begin to deal with this. I want to work on this. I am not happy with the distance between you and I. I'm no happier with it than you are. Let's remove the space between. Let's forgive mom and dad. Let's ask for their forgiveness. Let's begin to focus on sonship. Paul said, Lord, I want to know you not only in the power of your resurrection, but also in the fellowship of your sufferings. When God is taking you through this process, there's some suffering, there's some humility, there's some brokenness that takes place. But that's the key for God to be able to build things back up the way he wants to so that you can be everything he created you to be. Anybody receive that? Amen. So what are you going to do with this word? I want to encourage you to take this word of the Holy Spirit and just say, Holy Spirit, show me what you want me to receive from this word. The Lord gave a prophetic word at the very beginning of the message. The Lord said, change is coming swiftly. Not only is there going to be change in the earth, God's going to bring change in you. And he wants to break the circles. And he wants to break the cycles. It's interesting when you pastor a church this size. Because nobody can hide. And even as this word is being preached, I'm, holy, I'm hearing Holy Spirit say, I want to communicate this to this person. And that to this person. And a lot of you, I know your struggles. And I know what you've been through. This word today was for every single one of us. Every single one of us. It's time to let go. It's time to forgive. It's time to release. For some of us, it's mom. For some of us, it's dad. For some of us, it's brothers or sisters. For some of us, it's aunts or uncles. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. Holy Spirit's been speaking to you guys. And he'll continue to speak. So let's just do this. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. And Pastor Cindy, I'm going to ask you to put on the, the violin piece that I really, really like. Because the Lord really, really likes it. And we're going to do two things. We're going to pray together in response to this word. And then we're going to prepare ourselves to take communion. It's the first Sunday of the month. We're going to commune before the Lord today. And you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. Just a member of the family of God. So I invite everybody in this room to take communion with us today. Let's just take a moment. And let the Holy Spirit speak. I can lead you in a prayer of forgiveness. But this is something that the Lord really wants you to step out in and do. This is a message that requires action. And I want to encourage each and every one that's hearing this word 
to grab their prophetic notebook and get alone with God than to let God speak. Because God wants to begin to share with you where the roadblocks are, where the hurts are, where the pains are. At one point as I was struggling with what childhood had been like with my mom, Holy Spirit started sharing with me her childhood. And when Holy Spirit did that, I couldn't hold on to unforgiveness any longer. Because she went through things that I never dreamed that anyone would go through. I want to encourage you to get with the Holy Spirit and talk to the Holy Spirit about how to go through this process. But I beg you to do this. Because the Lord says there's cycles that I want to break. The Lord says there's brokenness that I want to heal. The Lord says there's pain that I want to remove. And the Lord says it's time. The Lord says it's time. Because the Lord says, son, I don't want you to walk in this any longer. My heart breaks and cries with you, but you don't come to me with it. Come to me. Let's do this together. Come to me. Let's do this together. Lord, the same way I love you, son. So I want to encourage you to respond to the Lord right now. Respond to the Lord right now. And the Lord may have some that are hearing this word right now say, Lord, I just come before you and I choose to forgive my mom and my dad. Or my dad or my mom. Lord, I choose to forgive them. Lord, they mistreated me. They didn't know how to love me. They hurt me. They wounded me. But Lord, I realized they were hurt and they were wounded. They were abused. They were abandoned by their parents. And they did the best they could. So God, I'm just going to choose to forgive them right now. And Lord, I realize at some point I closed off my heart to them. And at that point, I ceased to be their son or their daughter. I became independent, angry. I took my life into my own hands. And I ceased to honor them. Lord, I ask for forgiveness for that. And Lord, I'm going to go and talk to them and ask for forgiveness if they're still alive. I'm going to do it. You know, the Holy Spirit just said, some of you have parents that are still alive or a parent that's still alive. And the Lord says, if you will go to them and ask for forgiveness, it's going to open up the door for them to be saved. And then you're truly going to have a relationship with them when that happens. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I ask that you would release an anointing to forgive and to love, to let go and to hope in this room again. Holy Spirit, you spoke to Connie before service and you said, I'm going to release joy in this house to be. Lord, you said in Isaiah 61, I will give you beauty for your ashes. 
joy for your mourning and a garment of praise in the place of the spirit of despair. Sometimes we have to prime the pump for that to happen and do something the Lord is asking us to do, like ask for forgiveness, let go, to leave our Father's house. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take this word that's been released today to this group. Lord, it was also released online. And Lord, it'll be released on the radio. Lord, use this word to touch people's hearts and to touch people's lives. And Lord Jesus, I ask this now precious day. Amen. Now let's just take a moment and we're going to take communion. But the word says before we take communion we need to prepare our hearts. So before we take communion I want to encourage you just to talk to the Lord and to confess anything in your life that needs to be confessed. To get anything right with the Lord that needs to be made right with Him before we take communion. One way to do it is to just say, Lord, I just repent for anything I've done since the last time I took communion that's grieved you, that's honored you, that's displeased you. And prepare your heart for us to commune together. Here for a moment. Give a dad hug. Your love over this young man right now. Father, release your love over him. Lord, the hurt is deep. The things were real. Touch his broken heart. Touch his broken heart, Lord. Heal him. Lord, there's some amazing kids that need a dad. Lord, heal his heart so he can be the dad he needs to be. Heal his heart so he can be the son that he needs to be. Touch him. Heal him. Restore him, Lord. Do what only you can do. We ask you, young man, do you know that the Lord Jesus is in your life? Have you asked him in your life? Okay, good. That's the starting point. Then Holy Spirit, we just invite you to begin to take this young man through healing. We invite you to touch him, God. Lord, give him instruction on who to go to, what to say. Lord, bring healing in his heart and in his life. And I just ask this in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray even right now, may your Father's love flow through me into him, God. The love of a Father the love of thee, Father. Lord, release your love. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Oh, the Spirit of God is in this room right now. Oh, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you touch this young man right now. Touch you, Holy Spirit. Fill him with your presence. Blessing God. Lord, I hear you saying to him, Behold, I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to bless you and to prosper you, not to harm you. 
plans to give you hope in the future. And then you will seek me. And you will find me. When you seek me with all your hearts, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring you back from captivity. Lord, right now I stand in for this young man's earthly dad. And Lord, I release your blessing over him. Lord, whether earthly dad ever did or not, and I questioned if he did. Lord, I declare over this young man that he's a good son, that any dad would be proud to call his own. Lord, I decree and declare over him the dad blessing right now. Lord, I bless his life. I bless his family. Lord, I bless the work in his hands. And Lord, I free the son to become everything you created him to be. Lord, I declare he has worth, value, meaning, and purpose. And that his life is going to be used by you to do great things. Lord, I thank you that he matters. Whether dad ever told me, mom ever told me, you matter. And I bless you. And I pray may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom peace. May he bless the work of your hands. May he write his name upon your heart. And may you begin to feel like a son from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I just thank you today for your body that was broken for our sake. Lord, I thank you today for your blood that was shed for our sake. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, we repent this day for anything any of us have done since the last time we took communion that's grieved your heart. Lord, anything that we've done corporately that's grieved your heart. Lord, I thank you that your word says when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, today we've repented, we've confessed. Lord, now I pray that you'll release your cleansing. And Lord, as you've spoken today, much change is coming. Sudden change. Prepare our hearts for that, Lord. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for being the perfect spotless lamb. You came wrapped in flesh, your own creation. You died for us. You rose again. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Just thank you right now in your own way. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we just pray this now in your precious name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And everybody said, Amen. So guys, we're going to take communion together. Lord Jesus, I just bless this bread in your precious name, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the cup representing your blood. I just bless the cup in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Please stand up this morning. And I want to encourage you as we take communion this morning. Let's take it as a celebration of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Because of his shed blood, we can forgive. Because of his shed blood, we can be released like calves from the stall. Because of his shed blood, we can walk as sons and daughters. Let's 
celebrate the Lord's Amen. So what I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is come forward. I'm going to have you come down this aisle. Take a piece of bread and a cup and take it back to your seating area. And then we're going to partake together. Okay? Hallelujah. So I'm going to ask this group to come to the center and get their communion. Hallelujah. Now this group can come over in the aisle and come forward. standing up here with Pastor Josiah this morning. Hallelujah. And uh, we're going to take communion. How many know that communion is a time of celebration? It's a time of rejoicing. It's a time of release from the things that have hindered. And Lord Jesus, as we take communion together, I ask that you would rise up over us with healing in your wings, beams, and rays. And may we leap like calves released from the stone. Church, the word says that we believe in our heart, but we confess with our mouth. So please hold the bread up before the Lord and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your body that was broken for my sake. I receive everything that your broken body purchased for me 
for my family, for my generation, and for Israel. Lord Jesus, you are my healer. Jehovah Rapha. Church, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and the word says, he broke it. And he says, this bread represents my body that will be broken for your sake. This do in remembrance of me. Let us partake. You're thankful for Miss Holly's flatbread. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's hold the cup up before the Lord. And just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your blood that was shed for my sake. This day, I receive everything that your blood purchased for me, for my family, for my generation, and for Israel. Church, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents my body, or my blood, I'm sorry, that will be shed for your sake. And then he went on to say, and I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until we're all together. How many are looking forward to the wedding feast of the Lamb? Amen. In Israel, the Messianic believers, they say, Bo Yeshua Bo, which means come Lord Jesus, come. Say that with me. Bo Yeshua Bo, come Lord Jesus, come. Church, the Lord said that night, this do in remembrance of me, let us partake. Hallelujah. Love. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So Josiah and I are now going to speak the blessing over you in agreement the arianic blessing how many know the word says everything is established on the testimony of two witnesses so today we've praised together we've worshiped together we've received the word together and we've taken communion together now we pray over you may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom peace. May he write his name upon your heart and bless the work of your hands. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Pastor Josiah and I want to thank you for coming to the house today, for spending this day with us in the presence of the Lord. Now allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you regarding this word, to work you through the process. Stay in the crock pots and trust God. Amen. He who's begun this work in you is faithful to see it through to completion. So God bless you. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Get ready. Get ready. The Lord says change is coming. Mighty change is coming upon the earth. And I believe after we see this eclipse go through, we're going to see a lot of change in the aftermath. We're not following an eclipse. We're following Jesus. Amen. But amazing things are going to happen. So God bless you guys. May you go out with joy and be led forth with peace. And may the Lord's blessing be upon you. God bless you. Shalom.